So welcome everybody to Princeton University's Bentham Center for Finance uh, Masters in Finance information session for the program 2022. So welcome everybody for this information session. And uh, please, if you have questions, please put them in the QA box and we will address your questions at the end after some introductory remarks by myself. I'm Marcus Brunemeyer, the director of the Bentham Center for Finance. Then Caio Almeida will follow me he is the director of credit studies at the Bentham Center for Finance. And Lindsay Bregan will talk afterwards with Melanie Henry Scott, talking about placements and the academic programs and the application procedures and many, many things more. So let me start with a few introductory remarks. So as I said, first I will talk, then, uh, uh, then uh, Kai Almeida will talk and then Lindsay Bregan and then Melanie Henry Scott We'll talk about the application procedures and other uh, details of the academic program. So let me start with a little overview of the Bentham Center for Finance and the Master in Finance program. The Bentham Center for Finance is at the Princeton University. It was founded in the late 1990s, 1999 essentially, with a dedication to offer research and education in the field of finance and monetary economics. And we started the master's in finance program in 2001. We were one of the first master's in finance programs. And we would like to incorporate not only finance, but also economics and combine the economic and financial insights with some math and computer science and statistics knowledge. And that's essentially it's an, in, an intersection between finance and economics and the technical fields, math, computer science, and statistics. The intention of our program was to be small so that you have a close personal interaction between students and faculty. And there's a small group of students, uh, highly thought after, and the former community with the professions and also with the DCF alumni network. Overall, we have about 50 students over two years. Currently, we have 31 students in the first year out of the 31, the 45% female, and then in the second year, we have 17 students, 59% of them are female. So what we do is we support the placement of internship between the first and the second year. And then we also support the placement after the second year. And typically we have a 100% placement rate. So it's highly thought after uh, credits coming out of uh, the Benham Center for Finance. And in on top of the uh, master's in finance, you can also acquire a certificate in machine learning. We introduced this about two years ago, where we allow students in the second year to really zoom in on machine learning, the connection with finance, and this provides an additional benefit from joining to Princeton. You can also take courses across the whole university. So whatever your pleasure is, so you can take a music class or whatever you want. So certain classes will count against the requ requirement of getting the finance degree. Some of them will be additional uh, for your own knowledge to become a well-rounded uh, person. So in terms of faculty, so we will taught, you will be taught by faculty and you will pot potentially benefit from our advisory council as well. So the faculty, you know, in terms of asset pricing, part of finance is asset pricing that's taught by Moritz Lennel or Motohiro Yogo. The corporate finance component will be taught by Ernest Liu and Natalie Cox. The financial econometrics component, which is a big part of uh, the component, will be taught by Yasin Zahalia and uh, Kai Almeida, who is with us today, and Reni Kamona, who was, you know, very initially involved in founding the Master in Finance program. And then we have a class on FinTech, for example, which will be taught by Jonathan Payne, <clears throat> an assistant professor. And if you want to get more knowledge about monetary economics or macroeconomics, you can take a class with Alan Blinder, former uh, vice Fed chair, or of myself. And then, you know, the advisory council, which guides us, you know, if you make some strategic decisions, big uh, revamps of certain programs, you know, the advisory council helps us in this regards. The chairman is Ben Bernanke, who also founded the Bentham Center for Finance together with our first director, Yasina Zahalia. And the advisory council consists essentially of leaders of, in the area of finance, Wall Street, um, who is who's, 
and uh, they help us in many regards. They are also interact with students and can give you some guidance uh, if you need some guidance from particular uh, professionals. Now, just to give you an idea, the alumni network we have uh, is an important community to us. It's both they're very closely tied to the Bentham Center for Finance. They stay in touch with us over the years and also with each other because we have this BCF family concept. So everybody is tied together and uh, forms a community. And just to give you some ideas, some of our leading uh, alumni is uh, Anne Victor Orion. Uh, she was an MFIN from 2012 and she became the youngest partner ever at Goldman Sachs. We have Sarah Naji. She firm, formerly worked at Citadel's Ashlab Capital and recently launched an artificial intelligence startup called Seek AI. So Celine Tufitel, uh, she is the CFO of T. Rowe Price and was recently named in the Fortune's top 40 under 40 list. And then there's also Dennis Walsh, uh, is a global co-head of quantitative equity at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. That gives you just some ideas what some of our graduates are doing and which directions they're going after graduating uh, from Princeton and you know uh, being successful afterwards. What we did is uh, this year we classified our courses into three program tracks. So we have three distinct program tracks based on your career interest and goals. And this is just some guidance how you might want to structure your coursework. There's some core courses you have to take and then there's some elective courses and the tracks give you some guidance which courses you might want to take given your interests. And the first of these tracks is quantitative asset management. It focuses on designing and evaluating financial products that help organize uh, and organizations manage risk return trade-offs and risk management more generally. So you work on portfolio management, risk management, asset pricing and hedging. You're pro providing the necessary quantitative background to leaders and innovators in the growing field. So it's essentially, if you want to study uh, continuous time of uh, finance, stochastic so calculus, uh, courses are related to probability theory, optimization, stochastic calculus, dynamic programming, machine learning, and several disciplines in financial economics, which will help you to become an expert on that. So the emphasis here is on modeling and developing the models, bringing them to the data, estimating these models and developing new financial products, for example. And these uh, skills are highly requested at major investment banks, hedge funds, and successful quantitative asset management firms. So that's the first track you might find attractive. And then you have to take certain courses uh, assigned uh, to that. But you might also be much more uh, drawn to a different type of, uh, uh, of firms, which focus more on the data science and financial technologies. So if you're much more interested in, in computer-based technologies and big data in finance, the second track might be a guide for you which courses to take. So if you, it focuses on computational techniques needed in real-time computing environments, including efficient trading systems, algorithms, high frequency data analysis, interfaces, processing large data bases and data sets like big data and the security of computer networks. So it's very much data computer focused, managing huge data centers and extracting some information from that. This is actually very attractive for firms. So you will become very attractive to firms who are essential for computing financial firms more efficient trading processes, data signaling extractions with increased speed and lower costs. So if you were drawn to that area of finance, then actually you, the courses you might want to take is where you learn the latest tools and techniques of financial technology or FinTech, computer science courses, comp computational methods in finance, including again, machine learning, information retrieval and artificial intelligence and deep learning so you will be drawn to these type of courses, which we offer, you can take as well. And finally, we have the third program of our three tracks. That's about valuation and macroeconomic analysis. That's when you stress more the economics of it and the strategic understanding of firms valuation on the one hand, so evaluating certain firms, 
or understanding the macroeconomic conditions and how the macroeconomic conditions should affect you know, certain financial decision making. You study then how to evaluate and, and the financial investment projects, including startups, ventures, and so forth, how to structure a deal, and how to determine the optimal capital structure of a firm, potentially a startup, or an existing firm. You formulate strategies consistent with the expected performance of the macro economy. So you can either focus on firms, individual firms, or on you know, the whole macro economy if you run some portfolios and they're very much a global hedge fund, for example, global macro funds, then you have to understand the macro economies across various countries, across the various regions in the global economy. But then uh, you, it's really important that you take the third track. So the fundamentals for venture capital funds, global macro funds, strategic consultancies in finance, or you, you know, supporting a pension funds to make important investment decisions. So if you focus on the third track, you might emphasize more the courses related to global, uh, corporate finance, behavioral finance, investment projects, financial realizations, emergent acquisitions, some incentive designs to structure contracts who are for startups, IPOs, initial public offerings, still do some time series analysis for the macroeconomic aspects and learn more about asset and liability management. So this is for the third track. So again, let me summarize the three tracks again. The first one is very much on modeling, more stochastic calculus, continuous time modeling and bringing that to the data. And for example, developing new products. The second program was really data intensive, big data and trying to manage data in an efficient way, speed up, find some coding, which makes it faster. And the third track is more focused on the economics and the strategic aspects of investing which could be related to firms, understanding firms' valuations and their corporate structures, and, and also of the macroeconomy is the strategic aspects. So these are the three tracks we will offer you and give you some guidance. Of course, these are very loose. If you want a mixed combination of the three tracks, that's also fine with us. That's why when you come in, you will talk with the director of credit studies, Kai Armeda. You know, we design the program, whatever is best uh, for you. And there are numerous elective courses you can select from that. So what are the particular elective courses? Here I've just elected, selected a few of them, which I will have a little bit more tech focus. So we have the computer science from the computer science department, fundamentals of machine learning. But then you have a whole host of financial electives, which are FIN numbers, FIN courses like FinTech, we have a trading course, an institutional finance course, a behavioral finance course. We have an Asian capital markets course, but also then a Chinese financial monetary systems course, which is taught by Wei Shaw. Wei Shaw, one of the authorities in, in Chinese economy. And uh, you know, he teaches typically the Chinese financial markets course. And you can also take some quantitative data analysis and finance, which is very relevant for the machine learning certificate, for example, the FIN 580 course. And then you can take courses in operational research, financial engineering, in particular if you're very much data driven. So introduction to Monte Carlo simulations, high frequency markets, computational finance in C++, or again, in electrical engineering, you could take some machine learning and pattern recognition classes and other classes, classes related from SML, the Stochastic Machine Learning Center, which essentially grants you this machine learning certificate for the master's and finance students. So let me conclude with that. So I just hope it gave you a little bit of an overview how the Bandit Center came to, uh, to Princeton in a sense. And when we started the master's and finance program end of 2001, in 2001, and then we run it now for 20 years. And I think we are one of the leaders and one of the innovators in this space. And we actually you know, provide different tracks for you and a lot of elective classes. And let me pass on now the phone or the mic and the floor to Kai Almeida, who is our Director of Credit Studies. Thank you, Marcus. So welcome uh, all of you. And uh, it's great to be with you. And Marcus, I think he gave a great um, uh, overview of our program. What I want to do here is just kind of like I give you a bit more information about the, the, the course structure, right? So 
in general, what we have is like uh, the program uh, for most of the students, it's a two year uh, track program, okay? With uh, four courses per semester with a total of 16 courses. For, for, for a small number of students though, we, we offer like the, the fast track one year program, which consists of like uh, five courses per semester just during two semesters. But this uh, is based on a choice that is a, like a, comes from a combination of like a discussion of a committee from our department with the graduate school that decides on you know, like a, the ability, the, the, the math level of the students combined with other factors that would allow for this fast track. So usually we have a small number of students, like three, four, five at most with the one year. Most of the students uh, go through the, the, the two year program, which in particular I think is very interesting because it gives you a, a chance to have a, a summer internship and, and like I have an experience with a firm that later uh, can become your permanent job or, or not. So Lindsay is gonna talk more about that, but the two year program like allows you to have like to do things like a, more, uh, you know, like a, in, a, in a calmer pace. But in any case, so how do we start this course? With a, with a very intensive uh, math camp. It's a, a two week intensive uh, math course that covers like a, what we think are the, the basic uh, math machinery that you're gonna be using in, during the, 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 the masters. Uh, and that includes among other things, calculus analysis, linear algebra probability and stochastic process, okay? So there are some others like a smaller topics. We are always like a dynamic, dynamically changing, you know, like a, the, the distribution of, the, of this like a different like a, uh, subject in math, like according to what we think is necessary. But then you start with this two week math camp that kind of prepares the students. Then we enter in the semester, we have five core courses and 11 elective courses for the two year program and five core courses and, and five elective courses for the, for the one year program. So what are those courses? Let me see if I can control here the, okay. So uh, the first semester you have as, two, as core courses, uh, asset pricing, I think 501 that is taught by Moritz and uh, uh, I think 505 statistical analysis of financial data that is taught by Henry Carmona. So those courses we think are very important because asset pricing is the basis for any pricing of, of more like a complex uh, instruments, derivative, fixed income instruments. If you want to do portfolio management, risk management, we start giving you kind of the economic basis for asset pricing with this first core course. And the second course is more of a statistical course where you learn like uh, the basics of regressions, nonlinear regressions, some like a bits of machine learning, but not exactly like a, everything of machine learning, but some applications of like a, how you regularize regressions when you have like large cross sections. So can it teach all of this with a very practical course. Then for the second semester, we have three uh, core courses. Uh, and then like after that in the second year, the student's completely free to choose all the electives like that, uh, like that, that he or she uh, think is necessary, that are necessary. So for the second semester, we have corporate finance, basically like uh, you, you learn, and that's it, it taught by Ernest Liu, and uh, that, uh, where you learn, uh, you know, firm valuation, the structures of the firms, like uh, everything related to like uh, the, the firm structure. And then you have asset pricing too, which is kind of more a more advanced uh, you know, like a quantitative course where you, 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 you learn among other things, st stochastic calculus and, and how to price advanced derivatives. And then like in parallel to that, you have financial econometrics that, uh, that's uh, where you learn more about time series model, which are fundamental to, to like a, any modeling approach in any of the three tracks. I think it's important that you know, you know like a, how like a volatility is time varying, how you can like, approach a certain, uh, you know, like a structure for the, uh, all the uncertain uh, like factors that drive the uncertainty in the economy. So those are the core courses. And then you have like a bunch of electives as Marco uh, uh, cited before. And like there, there like you, can, you can study across the whole university basically, but there are some popular departments like uh, uh, among them economics, of course, like our department, like finance is inside the economics department. Then there is the operations research and financial engineering, which is also jointly in the program with us, but also courses in computer science, electrical engineering in the center for statistics and machine learning that definitely is an important center if you're like uh, aiming at getting the machine learning certificate and also the School of Public and International Affairs. So 
those are the usually main departments, but that doesn't prevent you from like uh, searching for some courses in other departments, but those are like, uh, and they offer like many, many different electives. And then like it comes, I'm gonna talk to you a little, talk to like explain to you a little bit more about the machine learning certificate that Marcos mentioned before. So for the students that, that like uh, are intending to, to, to get this certificate, you have a sequence of uh, demands that you have to satisfy. And they are basically like, you have to take one core machine learning uh, course from a list of courses, okay? So you can do like a, this uh, LA 535 is machine learning pattern recognition, which is more theoretical machine learning, or you can, you can be more interested in the computer science aspects of machine learning. Then you can take a course in the computer science department. Uh, it could be fundamentals of machine learning or theoretical machine learning, or you know, it's something like a hybrid, like this neural networks with, there is a lot of programming. It's kind of like a half theory, half practical. So you have to take one of this course, of course, that's not an extra course. You can use like one of your electives to take this course, okay? And then the same thing for the second, uh, the second demand, which is one core course in statistics and probability that can be chosen among the three. So the list is smaller than, than from machine learning. But again, you can study like a more, a more theoretical aspect of a statistics like with this or five to four, or more practical uh, aspects from this uh, course that's offered by the Machine Learning Center, which is topics in statistics and, and machine learning that now became modern statistics. So, you know, like there are different options or this advanced econometrics is a more advanced course that is also shared with our PhD students. And the third, uh, the third demand is like an elective course that you can choose from this two, but there are also other electives. You can get one of the core courses in machine learning and use as elective too. And like uh, after that, we have to participate on a, on a machine learning seminar, a weekly uh, seminar where students present either their own research or like uh, some other paper that they might be interested in learning about. So it's a very interesting, fun uh, seminar that, that like uh, meets once a week. And finally, the last uh, topic is like this thing 561 is the master's project too, which is basically like a, a master's project, research project where the student uh, you know, studies uh, a pr practical, practical problem and applies machine learning methods to, to try to solve this problem. So it's really like a, an opportunity of, of working with uh, a bit of research and usually guided by one of the professors like from the, from the Benham Center for Finance. And you end up writing a paper and giving a technical presentation as if, it, as, as if you were defending, you know, like a, a dissertation in, in, in the masters. And, um, Usually this takes like a, the students start uh, working in December and they go up to May and then they defend the, this project in May. It's a lot of fun. I've uh, been um, advising many of the students during the last three years and it's really like, a, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So some of the topics like, but you no, know, like not limited to it. Like we can, you know, if there is portfolio anal analysis with shrinkage estimators or pricing and hedging options, using machine learning methods, you know, like uh, anything related to text analysis, how to use text to forecast returns, to forecast volatility, just to learn about the text and try to come up with a fear index, you know, like there are so many options. Risk management of large portfolios, how you can regularize these kind of things. Solving partial differential equations or ordinary differential equations using machine learning methods and, uh, you know, uh, identifying patterns in high frequency uh, data. That those are some of the topics that uh, I like. Uh, I saw uh, the students working on, but like of course there are many more. And you know, like uh, I'm excited to uh, have uh, you coming to our center and also like uh, to take your questions. And the last thing I want to say before I uh, give the floor to uh, Lindsay is that uh, for every semester, as a, the director of graduate studies, I, I have meetings with uh, the students where we can you know like work on the choices of the courses according to like uh, your own uh, the, your own choice for the tracks. And that's also very nice because we can do that dynamically. If things are not working, uh, we can you know, like, uh, have conversations during the semester. I'm like I'm always there you know, to help you and to guide you. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, I hope to see you soon. Lindsay, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kayo. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about our program. 
My name is Lindsay Bracken, and I'm the manager of career development and external relations for, the, for Princeton's Bettenheim Center for Finance. Today, I'll briefly discuss our career placement and the resources available to our students, and then show you some placement statistics for the 2020-21 school year. What sets us apart from many other programs is the access we have to firms and training you get for your career. My job is simply to support you, help you thrive and get a job. My goal is to have you reach your greatest potential. I want you to succeed and I will help you do just that. Over the past several years, we have had 100% full-time job and internship placement rate. How do we accomplish this? Through unparalleled one-on-one -on -one career coaching. I'm available to meet with you as little or as much as you want. An active alumni network, strong partnerships and relationships across Wall Street. Partners who know our students and know that we are the best. And of course, the full resources that Princeton University has to offer. Let's look a little bit deeper at the Master in Finance career development timeline for a first year student. Starting in May, we will meet and get to know one another. We'll review your background, education, career history, and begin to set goals. Next, we will work to refine your resume and begin preparing for your technical interviews. In June and July, I will send the incoming class resume book to our corporate affiliate partners for first look recruiting, and interview, interviews will begin at the beginning of July. During this time, I will assign you your alumni mentor so you have another resource as you navigate the recruiting world. General recruiting will begin in August and continue through the fall. At the end of August, we will kick off the school year with our MFIN Bootcamp, an intensive three-day program that will afford you the opportunity to network with alumni, attend corporate affiliate and networking events, and listen to various leaders in the financial services industry. The boot camp also includes an interview prep course and mock interview ses sessions, both technical and behavioral. In September, companies will continue to come to campus to present and host exclusive networking events for our MFIN students. In addition, we host an, uh, an industry career speaker series, which will again give you the opportunity to gain a greater knowledge of the industry and exposure to industry leaders. Now let's take a look at some of our recruiting statistics. As I said earlier, in the 2021 school year, all of our students were placed in full-time roles and internships. And below is a list of all the companies that our students went to. Last year, 45% of our students went into sales and trading and capital markets roles at bulge bracket firms like Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, and Morgan Stanley. 37% of our students joined leading hedge funds and asset managers in quantitative research and trading roles like Citadel, BlackRock, and Capula, to name a few. The rest of the students went into prop trading, investment banking, and private equity. As you can see on this slide, the majority of our students tend to take positions in New York City, but we do have relationships in many of the financial hubs across the globe. This is a list of our corporate affiliates who I've mentioned in, uh, in our previous slides. They play a big role in the BCF community. Not only do they recruit many of our students on a yearly basis, but they also give their time, talent, and expertise to our students through mentoring and speaking engagements. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today. And I'm gonna pass this along to Melanie Heaney-Scott. Hi hey everyone, I'm Melanie Heaney Scott. I'm the Graduate Program Administrator for the Master in Finance Program. I work closely with uh, Kayo, our DGS, and you as students of the Master in Finance Program, um, keeping track, making sure you're on track with courses and helping you just basically behind the scenes, anything you need to know administratively, uh, deadlines for things, whichever. Um, just to let you know some key dates and deadlines, right now the application is live. If you haven't started it, I suggest you do. It gives you some time to think about it while you're working on it. Um, you can access that through our application website or the graduate admission website. And the deadline is January the 3rd. 
The deadline is quite strict in that it switches off um, at midnight Eastern Standard Time. And if you miss the deadline, unfortunately, the graduate school who control it will not let you submit your application. So I suggest if you're halfway through, consider working on it and getting it processed and put it through to us. Um, we don't have early decision, but we can still see your application once it's come through. Um, all the admission offers made to the students that we wish to offer admission to is done by the 15th of March after our committee have met and we have met with the deans of the graduate school who have the final say over our list of prospective students. Um, then that gives the students one month until April the 15th, which is a deadline that's pretty much across the US in graduate schools. Um, April 15th is the deadline to submit your decision to the school of your choice. Uh, the next one really is Math Camp. Um, it's really a math refresher course. It's nothing scary, don't worry about it. And that starts this year on Monday, August the 22nd for two weeks, right before Lindsay's boot camp. And then fall term classes will start on Wednesday, the 6th of September at 8 a.m. sharp. Uh, by then you'll be fully in the role of a master of finance student. Um, just some statistics to let you know about. Um, we, our department still requires a standardized test, so we do prefer the, G, the GRE over the GMAT. Um, and GRE, we've had some questions. Uh, ETS uh, permitted students to take um, online GRE tests at home last year during the pandemic when their centers were closed. So we obviously will accept those test scores because they are official. However, all scores must be sent directly from ETS the graduate school and the department will not accept self-reported test scores. Um, if they're missing, we'll chase you for them. Uh, same goes with the TOEFL or the ILTS if you are required to submit them. Um, obviously here you can see on the slide, we had an average uh, GRE quant score for our incoming class this year of 167, roughly 94%. And then if you're taking the TOEFL or the ILTS, you have to have at least 27 on the TOEFL IBT or eight on the ILTS speaking section. Um, those test scores for the languages are set by the graduate school. So if you have questions about that, visit their website. There's quite an intensive page with all sorts of details. Um, there are some people who can get waivers, but you'll need to read it. There's a lot of details to read. Okay. Um, I, I, Admission and acceptance rates, just to let you know, we roughly get 600 plus applications and it's rising each year. Um, our admittance rate is 5% of those applications and our acceptance rate of offers made is roughly 76%. Um, we are a small program. So obviously, you know, we take the cream of the crop and we hope that you are. So good luck with your applications. If you have any questions, please email me. I'm always here to answer questions about application procedures, requirements, anything like that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mel. Uh, now let's move on to the Q&A section of, the, um, of this presentation. We're gonna start off with an application question for Mel. Why is the class size this year nearly doubled compared to last year? It actually isn't. Um, it looks it, but it's not. We have, we have a cohort over two years of 50 students. As I said just before, we are a small program. It's intentionally kept small. Um, the numbers you saw on the, the slide was 27, not 27, down to 17 um, second years. That's because students graduate who came for one year. And then the first years coming in makes it up to back up to 50. Thank you. We also had four students that deferred due to the COVID crisis. So that's why we got more students this year. So five were to the fast track, four uh, deferred from last. Another question related to the application, where's the one-year master program link? What kind of candidates are qualified for application to a one-year uh, master program? Marcus or Kaya, do you wanna take that? I, I, can take it. I can take it. 
Well, it's uh, there is no uh, clear like defined answers who, who will take the one year program because as I was telling you, it's a committee from our department deciding together with the graduate school. So even if we say like a, a student is going to take the one year track, the graduate school has to approve. In general, the main characteristic that we use is if the student is well prepared to take all the math that's necessary to take five courses per semester, which is a very, very high loading. Also, you have to keep in mind, it's very important that all these students that come for the one year track, they have to be recruiting in the second semester of the year. You look at for uh, like for their like a permanent job, I mean, a permanent first job instead of be recruiting for uh, like a summer job. So it is really, really an intensive uh, program. So that's why we, we intentionally only select a small number of students to follow this uh, track. Sometimes the student is already like a, a you know like a, in a firm and it, it comes that no, has enough math knowledge and then goes back to the same firm or to a bank. So that's also another factor that uh, is important to decide for the one year track. Marcus, you want to like say yeah, something? I just wanted to add. So it depends very much whether you've seen a lot of finance background already. So if you have taken a lot of classes in during your undergraduate studies, for example, and uh, we get the impression you know, taking the air surprising class or some uh, statistics class, and you have done this already before, uh, then you can do it in one year. But it's a combination of things, uh, keeping in mind that you have seen a lot and you have a strong, extremely strong math background. And, you know, it's uh, uh, for you also, you don't, it's not, typically it's helpful to do an internship after the first year, then you convert this in a permanent job after the second year. If you don't need that for any other reasons, that's also a plus to be more eligible for that one year. But we make a, a judgment based on all the string ingredients, whether that's appropriate for the student in his best interest. Before we move to the next question, just adding to what Marco said, that's true. In general, it's like a more interesting to, to go through the two year track for the students. You know, like that's the experience that we have after many years we have in like these two groups. Okay. Can I just add to that as well? You said about a link. There is no link. You just apply for a two-year program. Okay. We have a, a question from um, uh, an individual who applied last year to our program. Uh, she works in fixed income uh, quantitative research team at an investment bank. Uh, she applied to the program last year and had two interviews, but was rejected, and she'll be applying this year. She wants to know um, if there's anything specific that she should be including in her personal statement or recommendation letters um, or any advice we could give to someone who's reapplying to the program. I'll start off. Um, there's a lot that goes into making up a class of students. Um, many factors and we look to create a cohesive class. So there's not necessarily one specific thing that we are looking for in someone's application, but when creating the class, we look for a group picture. Um, that's from my perspective. Kyle, would you like to answer? Yes, I mean, like, uh, uh, that's true what you're saying. And basically like we get to, a, since we have a very, very large number of applicants, we get to a, a smaller number of, of, of excellent applicants with very similar characteristics. So in the end, we have to really like a, try to, you know, like a choose from the set and then like a, the letters of recommendation are very important. You know, like the, the results uh, with your, your, like the, your GPA, but like um, the most important things are that we want to be able to access, you know, like a, about the history that you had in terms of like the contact with finance and economics, also like a, how, uh, both uh, professors in academia as well as people in the industry perceive like uh, your work and like uh, from that we really get to a decision so it is very hard to say a priori like uh, who is going to be in this final uh, group because as I was telling you if we have 600 applicants we go down to 100 excellent uh, applicants and then from there we have to still go down to something like around 35 40 applicants so that's very hard like a uh, Three stage uh, process. Marcus, you want to add something to that? No, I think uh, you covered it very nicely. Both of you. 
Is there financial aid offered, Mel? Unfortunately not. Um, it's not something advertised because it's not something that is available to the uh, master's students from the graduate school. However, the program does have limited funds and we can offer some funds to students, um, obviously needs based, and then it's discussed after admission is offered. It never covers a whole year. It never covers even a quarter of a semester. It's very limited because we rely on our um, donors to denote, donate to us. We don't get money from the graduate school. Will there be any interviews during the application process? I'll answer this. Uh, we interview approximately um, 100 of the top students, but the number varies each year. There will be interviews. Next question. Are there standardized standardized tests that only select is, are the standardized quest test the only selection criteria is there an additional consideration for those who already have a master in other disciplines kayo yes 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 so the standardized tests they give us some information about like how you know, like a, a re, a able to do like a very basic math you know like oh, the, this tricky math like the student is now so that's kind of like a on a negative factor than a positive factor meaning like if the student didn't get a very good uh, GRE score then like from this very large pool uh, of candidates we say okay we like uh, maybe we should like uh, give the opportunity to another student because despite the fact I saw one of the questions asking like uh, if there is like a different need in terms of math for the different tracks and Marcos can say more about that but yes like uh, depending on how you design the program uh your, your track you can like uh, do like less mathematical things but there is a core of courses and you know like uh, there is math, math is necessary like a uh, like basic math is necessary and like some advanced math and uh and then we start by using the gre as like this trigger to see like uh if we should eliminate or not like the the candidate and after that then the letters of recommendation are fundamental because if we can like uh, access information from people that you know like we somehow have some information about professors or people in the industry that is very good to hear you know like their relationship with the candidates and uh the gpas and also the kind of courses and the kind of like uh, uh you know like uh topics that the students studied before give us information about this uh this choice so it's an overall it's a combination of factors the jerry is just a small part of it We have some questions about um, um, work experience and internship experience. And the questions are about whether or not these exp this experience helps a candidate's application or not, if it's something that we look, in, look at and take into account. And specifically, one of these people uh, worked as a quant trader or quant researcher in the past. Does that influence the application? It helps to like have worked as a quant trader. Definitely helps. God means like that you are connected to like the quant area, so you know like a quant like methods, and you have some experience of work. So Lindsay can say more about that. We usually we want the, the the candidate to have some experience, not necessarily extensive experience, because you know that that's not the point of the program. But you know we have we want the candidate to have had some summer jobs. Let's let's say like two or three like rounds of uh, summer internships and uh, or maybe one year of work or like a two years of work and wants to uh, kind of like enter in the program and learn like new techniques and get back to the market. So that definitely some experience helps. And especially if you were a quant before, that's good. I don't know, Marcus and Lindsay want to like uh, add to that. Yeah, so let me just leave it to Lindsay on this, but let me just say typically it's, as you said, Cairo, it's a plus. Um, it's not required, but it, it's, uh, it, you know, nothing, nothing is a necessary uh, condition, but it's, it's a big plus uh, because it shows that it's more easy to find a job afterwards as well. Uh, Lindsay can give a better perspective on that. I think there's two type of candidate, two types of candidates that apply to the program. The first is someone who's right out of school, and typically we like to see someone with a, some internships under their belt if they're coming right out of out of undergrad. 
Um, and then someone who um, is applying after working in a position for, um, you know, the best, best um, case is under four years. Um, you know, we're looking for someone who's been in the finance field or can be pivoting in their career and looking to try something new. And that's why they're coming into the program. Uh, we have some program related questions for Kyo and Marcus. Does valuation and economic analysis co concentration require less mathematical background than other concentrations? So let me, yeah, let me pick this one. So in general, our program is quite math focused. So you have to come up with good math background. Uh, that's a prerequisite uh, for our program. Among the three tracks, uh, the third track is focusing more on the strategic aspects and evaluation aspects, which are probably less, or they are, they are less math heavy at the end of the day compared to the very math heavy, let's say the first track, which is you know a lot of stochastic calculus. Uh, in this sense, that's correct. Uh, but overall, I think our positioning of the mass and finance is way more math focused, let's say compared to an MBA, there's no comparison to that. Uh, it's very much on math focused. It's probably slightly less math focused compared to a pure mathematical finance program. Uh, we actually emphasize much more the economics as well. So we would like to have a nice combination between being good in math and being able to apply this and solve uh, quantitative problems, but also at the same time, having good economic and financial intuition and connection to the real world. So not purely a math person who sits uh, in the background solving certain math problems. Uh, it is a nice combination of both. And as the question indicated, the third track is emphasizing and the, the strategic valuation aspects and the macroeconomic aspects more than the first two tracks. Is this program appropriate for a student who is interested in pursuing a PhD or postdoctoral research program after completing the MFIN degree? Perhaps I'll take this too. Uh, so it's a, it is, could be a stepping stone to a PhD. So we most of our graduates go to the financial industry. Occasionally, let's say every other year, there's one member in the program who decides to continue. Uh, he finds his passion in doing academic financial research. Um, he finds his passion and continues with a PhD. And this PhD can happen uh, if he's admitted to the economics PhD program at Princeton or also in some other PhD program uh, across the country or across the globe. So it's actually a possibility, it's a stepping stone but it's a very rare occasion. So it's, I would say every other year, one person out of the small program we have, um, they, are, they want to do that. So the majority of uh, the people who attend this program, their intention is actually to go and do something in the financial industry. Can you share what financial data source tools are available for research undertaken by students? Uh I don't, remember, I don't remember everything on the top of my mind, but we have like a, a finance librarian that has, like offers us like a, like a full help and like a, we have access to like option metrics to the crisp data. Like already this tool have like pretty much most of what we need, but like in some valuation data in another database, I don't remember what it is, but like I know like the main data sets, uh, they are available at Princeton and the student can access remotely or go to the library for some of them and collect data there, like they are Bloomberg terminals. I mean, like we are like well served uh, with that. And on the top of that, we have one librarian fully dedicated just to help the students, not only in the, their research projects, like for instance, when we are like doing the master's project, but also in, in any course, every semester, she's amazing. She like emails me asking, if we need help, if she like can be useful, like uh, bringing some data to the risk management course, fixed income, course, all the courses. So that means that we have like uh, access to data. But if you want to ask more specific data sets, you can send me an email and I can find out and, and send you like the answer back, okay? For the, this person that asked the question. So Kaya, can you elaborate a little bit on the statistic software packages and other softwares used in the various courses as well? 
Oh yes, so we 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 have like definitely like a, a lot of uh, well, not not a lot but some courses that that really like are intensive in Python programming. Like for instance, fintech is one of them with Jonathan. He like uh, teaches half the course micro theory, half is machine learning with applications, like with a view of an economist to that. So I think it's pretty interesting. And like he uses Python, so like the students, like they have to know, like a, have a basic knowledge there, but they learn a lot of Python, but R with Rene in the core course. So that R appears multiply, like in multiple courses, also Python, MATLAB, um, uh, Mathematica, I wouldn't say, but uh, yeah, so those are the, and eViews, those are the softwares that I, I mean, oh, and of course, like a, you know, like a many packages that are specific to like a, a courses, like a, neural network packages like a machine learning packages in python different languages uh that are like a you know requested and like a courses like for instance the core courses in machine learning or jonathan's course so yeah i think that those are the main that i remember like maybe there might there, there are some actually there are some disciplines in the university not like in the benheim center for finance that use julia programming too Another question asks if it's important that a student who's applying have an idea or a clear idea of which track they want to pursue, for example, writing it in their personal statement, or is it okay to decide at a later date? Kayo? No, no need to, to, to have to, to know the track a priori. Like uh, we, we, we are offering these tracks as, as a new strategy just to kind of help the student to organize, you know, like the program, his mind. He, his or her mind so you can really like enter and like uh, find out like uh, according to the first semester like of the level of the math courses the type of courses uh what exactly is the path that you want to take you know like you have two core courses and two electives so they're not you there are some options but that's the first semester there is recruiting on the top of that so there's a lot of work then you have some time to kind of like a discover like uh, which path you would like to to take and then you can say oh i really like the quant stuff so i'm gonna look focus on that or like i like the strategic valuation and then you can you know, like uh, concentrate on that like there are many courses offered for the three different options of course like for the data track that like the, it, it's enormous because you can like just like a uh, compose with the computer science and like a uh, electrical engineering department so you can really choose after you you enter the program Thank you. Um, there's a question about minimum number of uh, years of work experience, and then a question about the proportion of students with full time work experience versus those straight from school. Um, so there is no minimum number of years for work experience. Um, you know, we like to see a student with you know, a couple years out, outside, out of school, but we do have a couple students in our current class who have been in the workforce for more years, than, more than four years. Um, as I said earlier, if you are coming from college, it does help to have some internships under your belt. Uh, in terms of the proportion of students who with full-time experience versus internship ex experience or full-time experience or from straight out of school, um, I did a quick calculation and this year's class, 41% um, of the students have full-time work experience. Um, one of the, we have a question here, I'm, I'm just gonna condense it a bit. Uh, the student is asking, they've transferred from um, a, a, a university and they're at a new university. Um, they said, it appears that our current class came from top universities. Um, is it important that um, a student come from a top university? Let me perhaps jump in on this. I don't think it's important at all. I think we really encourage uh, applicants from a broad set of universities. And actually we see the value added of this program to bring you know, some students from any university at the higher level. And the value added is probably you know, the highest if uh, they come from anywhere. So we probably, would go the other way uh, in this sense. We are more worried about learning about the candidate if there is a chance that the candidate is going to thrive, is prepared to take the math necessary and not like the, the title of the candidate. So we really go after like a how you know, like strong like uh, and solid like uh, is the math knowledge and the 
general finance knowledge of the candidate like before we choose, not about the title, yes. Well, that's all the questions we have for this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And uh, we look forward to reading many of your applications. Please get them in. Uh, in our thank you email, you'll receive our email addresses. And please feel free to reach out to any of us. We're happy to help answer any questions that we may not have addressed this evening. So I think there is one last question. Oh. Look, take a look uh, that appeared right now about the coffee chat. So see, no? Is there any coffee chat sessions with the current second year students? We do not have any schedule for this year. Okay, okay so well. Perhaps we'll think about it. Perhaps we can develop something like that. We haven't prepared for that particular offerings. Um, Mel, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we have some kind of application questions. Um, have some questions about scholarships. Um, if someone is an, an international student, are they eligible for a scholarship? And if so, um, what types of scholarships are available? Um, unfortunately, the graduate school don't uh, give any funding at all whatsoever to the master's students. Um, the program itself, uh, Master in Finance, we have limited supply of funds to give. Um, it never covers a year and it generally is about half a semester. And that is obviously needs based and something that is discussed after admission has been offered. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, another question, do you accept the online GRE or do you accept the GRE in general? We accept the GRE, so our preferred method. Um, we do also accept GMAT. Last year with the COVID pandemic happening, um, ETS decided to let people take the tests online at home. So yes, it's an official test, so we will accept it, but it has to come directly from ETS. We and the graduate school don't accept self-reported test scores. Great, thank you, Mel. Um, is this program more focused on academic finance or career in finance? Marcus, do you want to take this one? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Happy to take that. So typically, it's really uh, focused on career in finance. So most of our students, after completing the MFIN, they go to work in the financial sector. There is occasionally a student who switches to the PhD program. Uh, you know, that's every other year one student who might think you know, he falls in love with academic finance, and then he switches over to do a PhD, either in, at Princeton or some other institution. Uh, but that's not the rule, essentially. is That's exception. The rule is that people go to the career in finance. Thank you. And what's the reason behind the new way of structuring the program in three tracks? So essentially the structuring of the program, we wanted to make it more explicit what the opportunities are, which areas of finance you can go and what you know, uh, courses we will offer in order to make you successful in these areas. It uh, doesn't change fundamentally our program. So we have offered the courses before, we find tweak it here and there, but it doesn't really change the program uh, at all. It just makes it a much clearer communication uh, strategy for us uh, that uh, the student can decide, okay, I would like in the long run, would like to go in this particular area is now a clear idea of uh, how the industry can be divided in the three tracks and which courses would be best suited for him if he wants to go there. But you don't have to decide up front already which track you take. You can actually then decide this when you speak with the director of credit studies, um, uh, you know, which course might be the optimal one for you, and you don't have to stick within the track either. So it's more a communication, a clear communication device, and to give the students more guidance, uh, which courses are best suited for what career they might pursue later on. Thank you, Marcus. We have some couple, a couple of career questions here. Um, someone asked about career paths, roles, and companies that graduates generally go to. Um, I tried to show a slide about that. Um, I think you've seen the companies. 
in general, most of our students um, end up working at hedge funds or bulge bracket firms. Sometimes they go into investment banking, fintech, or private equity. Uh, generally, the, generally, the roles at um, uh, on the buy side and the sell side are more quantitative roles, um, and that's what really attracts companies to our program, um, that our, our students are very strong in that category. Another question we have that's career related. Um, I will be 34 years of, of age at the time of joining the program if I am selected. I have seven years of work experience in risk modeling and have created and completed a CFA and FRM. I know there's no explicit age limit, but do you encourage can older candidates like me to apply for the program? There is no explicit age limit at all. We recommend that students have uh, about three to four years experience, but we do have many, we do have a couple of students that do have a little more experience and they tend to be very successful in our program as well. Marcus, do you wanna to add to that? No, I just uh, would echo what you said. I think that's very much capturing it. Uh, we occasionally have older students who have very limited work experience. So we have a whole range of things. We just will evaluate an annual basis, which where we think you would fit very well, well in our program. Absolutely. Students come from no work experience or internship experience only. We do recommend that you, you um, have internship experience, a couple of years of experience or um, are seasoned uh, workers. Uh, are most of the jobs that students land career entry level, so for first year analyst, or do some student, students land more senior positions? Um, and what's the predominant factor for both of these outcomes? So typically, if a student comes from right out of college, they'll land associate positions uh, because they are getting a master's degree. Um, if they uh, have some work experience, they'll generally end up in an associate position as well, but really it is on a case by case basis. Um, and yeah, that's it for that question. Mel, I'm going to uh, send this to you. I have a 170 score in uh, the general, in the quant section of the GRE general test. Um, but the subject test, the GRE subject test is not offered um, in, in this person's region. What would you recommend they do? Absolutely nothing. We don't, we don't require the subject test. Um, our incoming class last year had an average 167 quant score. So I'd say definitely you should apply. <laughs> Thank you. And Marcus, what are some other programming languages for finance? that are used in the education program pro process? I mean, that's very different. I mean, there's a huge emphasis on C++, but there's also, we use R, some classes use Python. So it's used all of the uh, very, very different program, but there's C++, the core, uh, in the fall semester, the class uses C++ primarily, but, you know, in the econometrics parts, they often use uh, more R uh, and, you know, but if you go to more advanced classes, you might also use Julia and other things. So it's, it's a broad range of uh, languages you might learn. Thank you. Um, Mel, we have a couple more questions um, that are related to the admissions. What is our acceptance rate? Roughly 5%. Thank you. Um, and do you have to self-report your TOEFL scores? No, we don't accept self-reported scores. They must all come from either ETS for TOEFL or IELTS um, through their system as well. We, we, we don't and the graduate school won't, they will just deny them. Great, and is there the opportunity to apply for an application fee waiver? Um, again, that's something the graduate school organize. Uh, I know they do have fee waivers available for US citizens, permanent residents, but unfortunately they don't have very many for international students. I would suggest looking at the graduate admission website. Um, if you can't see anything specific, I would suggest emailing them um, to ask them if you can qualify for it. Thank you. 
Uh, another student asked, is saying that they completed a pre uh, MFE course at another college. They're asking if they can provide a letter of recommendation and put this on their application form and if it will be considered. Um, yes, please put it on your application form. We will look at everything. You'll be able to include your resume as well, where you'll be able to put down what the course is. You also write a, uh, an essay and you'll be able to tell us about anything that you want to tell us. So please include everything and anything on your application. We're interested in, in learning all about you. Who are the students that are eligible for the one-year track? Marcus? So this depends very much what the knowledge you come in with. So if you have a lot of pre-knowledge on, on the finance-related issues, also mathematical background, uh, then we will uh, evaluate whether you can do the one-year track. Typically, uh, you have to keep in mind, it will be more difficult to find uh, you know, a, a wonderful job afterwards uh, because it's easier to find a job if you do an internship in between the two years and then subsequently uh, do of get a job from the internship. So overall, um, but it depends really on how much knowledge you have in advance and what you can handle uh, the five plus five courses. And, uh, you know, we have to be as well trained as somebody who takes it in two years. So if you don't have any pre-knowledge, then it will be very hard to be accepted in one year class. But it will be decided upfront when you get the offer. Thank you. And what would constitute a strong application? Marcus, why don't we take this together? You can get started. So typically a strong application, I think what is really critical that you have some math background, so that you have some strong technical skills on the one hand, but you also have some good common economic sense. So you have some economic evaluation ability, so you can have some skills where you can judge whether something makes economic sense or not. So it's a combination of two. So our program is not like many other math finance programs where it's just purely applying math and solving certain uh, equations. It is a combination of both. So you have to have some ability to do some math and also some statistical methods, but combine that with good economic reasoning. So that's essentially where we are different. We are in between the two with between an MBA, which is, you know, more soft skills, leadership skills, which you need in our program as well. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, having some mathematical skills and programming skills and statistical skills. So you need all of that. Of course, it might be less technical than a pure math finance uh, program. And it is definitely more technical than you know, an MBA program, let's put it this way. Thank you. We have a couple of questions um, about work experience and different uh, sectors that people may um, go to after our program. Um, someone's asking about um, having work experience. Is that essential for a successful application? Absolutely not. Um, many students come right out of college. Uh, I will say that it is helpful to have some internship experience during your college years. Um, that can help you kind of determine what parts of the of the of the industry interest you, and also just a little bit of work experience. Um, I have another question about uh, breaking into private equity or venture cap venture capital or program. Is it is our program well suited for this? I would say our program is well suited for most types of areas in the financial services world. I will say that most of our students do tend to lead towards um, more of the buy side or sell side head funds or investment banks. We do every year have a couple of students who go into private equity and venture capital. Mel, I have um, some more questions for you on GRE and GMAT. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us, is a GRE strongly preferred over GMAT? Yes, it is. Uh, well, G GMAT is mostly taken by students going into business school, whereas a GRE is graduate record of education, so it's more towards the education side than business. Thank you. And um, do you offer delayed admission? No. 
And how important is it for your was that no? <laughs> how important is your GRE if you have excellent grades in an undergrad institution from a reputable university? Well, this all the this, all the students will submit GRE scores, which is obviously an extra step in the application process. Um, if you don't have them, you're missing something in your application. And it's is something that we require. So I would suggest that you take the GRE and send it to us. Thank you. Um, okay. You guys are have so many questions here. Um, well, one more for you. Uh, what's the offer? So we we said the offer. Uh, we said the acceptance rate. What is the offer rate? Oh, um, off the top of my head, I can't say. It's I would imagine we're round about the same kind of number. Maybe um, I mean I can give you exact numbers over the years, but I can't give you a sort of percentage. <sighs> Go, if you'd like to know more say. about that information, please email Melanie. We'll be yes. um, sending out email addresses after this, and you can. She would love to follow up with you on that. Um, Marcus, is C the only programming language that's required required for the core classes in the MFIM program? I mean, it's yes for for the C will be for the core classes. That's the only one required. But there are many elective classes which use some different software, the programming language as well. So and are there it will any, be hard to get through the whole program only knowing C++. Are there any courses that um, require prerequisites? No. If you're accepted to the program, uh, you can do it. Uh, you can acquire all the knowledge you need to know from the courses offered here at Princeton. Thank you. Um, you mentioned internship experience is recommended. How about research experience? So you don't need any research experience coming in. Uh, it's, it's a plus. So we look at this too. So every application will be looked at and evaluated. If you have some research experience, let's suppose you were a research assistant at some Federal Reserve a Bank or something, it will be a plus as well. We would consider it like a uh, practical experience uh, working for a bank. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of students have put it, who have put in some specific questions um, about their application. Um, Melanie and I are available to talk to you in our various areas um, if you want to reach out to us at a later date. Um, but that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Marcus? I thank you all. And I thank uh, Lindsay and Melanie and the whole team for putting this whole thing together. And I thank you, you for your interest in uh, figuring out what's offered by, by Princeton, the Bellingham Center for Finance. And I hope that you will all apply, consider it seriously, and what that will help your, your path in your life and your career. And uh, we hope to look at your application. And if you have questions, as Lindsay said, send it to Lindsay, Melanie, or to the BCF at Princeton.edu account. And this way you will get all the knowledge, all the information you need in order to have a successful application. Thanks again, and hope to hear from you or read from you uh, latest by end of December. Good luck. Good luck to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.